All right, thanks, Mike. Um, well, as he said, my name is Tony Hall. I'm wearing three hats today. First of all, I'm a carer for Barbara, uh, but I'm the chair of Bristol Dementia Action Alliance, and our aim is to make Bristol a dementia-friendly city. And uh, the, third, the third hat I wear is uh, that Barbara and I are members of Westbury Baptist Church in Westbury on Trim. So we've been asked to come along today to talk to you because you're thinking about becoming a dementia-friendly community by having things like coffee mornings or perhaps a memory cath, perhaps having a singing for the brain. That's all good stuff, but before you do any of that, you need to know a few basics about dementia, don't you? Like, what is it? Uh, how do you identify it in people? And once you've identified it, what do you actually do to support that person with dementia? So what your plan is, is great, but we need to do a few basics first of all. The thing is, whenever we think about dementia, we think in neg negative terms, don't we? But there are 850,000 people in this country living with dementia. And there are probably people around here uh, that have got dementia. <laughs> dementia is not a natural part of... Aging. We're all getting older. It starts at birth and it ends with it when it ends. But because we're getting older, doesn't mean to say that we're going to get dementia. It is not a natural part of ageing. We also do these sessions with children in schools and scouts, guides, cubs, brownies, rainbows, beavers, youngsters, and one of the questions they ask is, can you catch it? No, you can't. You can't catch dementia. Children particularly say, can children get hold of it? Well, I'm on several Facebook groups because of BDIA, and I have only ever heard of one child a little girl called Isabel, who was 11, that had symptoms of dementia. So she was, which is tragic really, because that's tragic for a child. But bearing in mind there are six billion people on this planet, one in six billion is pretty lo long odds. So can children get it? Very, very rarely. <coughs> dementia is caused by something of the brain. Diseases. We've all got a brain. Our brain contains trillions of brain cells. And what happens when we get dementia is some of those brain cells die prematurely. And depending which brain cells die will affect the sort of dementia you get. Now Barbara's got frontal temporal dementia. She's had symptoms since 1999. So it's coming up for 20 years now. <coughs> and that would indicate that the brain cells towards the front of her brain are the ones that are mainly affected. Maybe a few others elsewhere, but generally it's the brain cells at the front of her brain that are affected and the effect that it's changed her personality and it's changed her behaviour. She's always smiling at you now. A couple of months ago she'd have got up and hugged you all as you came in. A uh, bit embarrassing when you go in the supermarket and I'm putting stuff in the trolley and I turn around there's my wife in a big embrace with a strange bloke who's saying, who is this woman? Get off me! And I have to explain that she's got dementia and after that, they calm down, because us blokes, we're not used to women throwing themselves at us, are we, lads? <laughs> so, uh, well, I'm, okay, I'll speak for myself. So it can change your personality and your behaviour. And as I say, she hugs everyone, or, or did hug everyone. Uh, but all dementias are a disease of the brain. One common type of dementia is? Alzheimer's. It's the most common. 70 to 80 percent of people with dementia have got Alzheimer's. There are other common types. Frontal temporal that Barbara's got is fairly common. There's another one called vascular dementia that you may have heard of. And this can result from one of two things. Either a really poor diet. Don't think we tend to get that in this country because we're a first world country. And when I say a really poor diet, I mean a really poor diet. Or more commonly in this country, it can follow a series of TIAs or mini strokes, can actually leave you with vascular dementia. Another common one is dementia of Lewy bodies. And what happens there is particles get in the nerve ends and it causes, causes you to have really bad dreams, you hallucinate. A friend of mine who actually does sessions like this and he speaks at dementia conferences, he's got dementia of Lewy bodies. And the way it affects him, his energy levels are great in the morning, but in the afternoon, as it, as it approaches tea, tea time, 
he suffers from what's called sundowning. As the sun goes down, so his energy levels flag. Mind you, he gets up at half past five in the morning, so my energy levels would be beginning to flag as well. But that's the way uh, it affects him. And if you look at the Alzheimer's Society website, you'll see there's over a hundred different types of dementia. But the ones I've uh, just talked talk to you about, they're the most common. So all the others are quite rare. Alzheimer's disease usually starts by affecting people's... Children. Children. Have you ever gone upstairs, get to the top of the stair and you think, what do I come up here for? Have you ever done that? Yeah. That's called a senior moment. Okay, that's not a short-term memory problem. Dementia is not just about losing your memory. As I said, Barbara goes around smiling at everybody, hugging total strangers. Now, when I met her 50 odd years ago, she was quite reserved, quite shy in fact, unless you put her with a group of children and then she'd have danced on the table because she's a nursery nurse. Children are her life. So to see her behaving the way she does now with total strangers is a change of behaviour. Now, as I said, we sometimes do these sessions with scouts, guides, cubs, brownies, and, and so on. And they meet in a church hall, and generally, one of the things I say to them is, can anybody tell me what the time is? So they all look at the clock, and they say, 10 past seven. What's the time again? 10 past seven. Can anybody tell me what the time is? 10 past seven. Can anybody tell me what the time is? And I ask them eight times. By the eighth time, they're screaming, hey, are you thick or something? It's ten past seven. We told you seven to... They're not saying that, but they have body languages. And they suddenly realise that I'm winding them up. Excuse the pun. But I said to them, I say to them, what you're experiencing there is what someone living with someone with dementia might experience. Because someone with dementia might become a clock watcher. Or they might keep repeating the same thing over and over again. What's for lunch today? Fish and chips. What's for lunch today? Fish and chips. And it can get really monotonous and it, it can wind you up. But you have to remember that the person is ill. They're not doing it to wind you up. They're doing it because they've got this condition called dementia. So when they do it, you have to use what you do when a child keeps on repeating the same things. You use diversion tactics and you try and change the subject to move their brain onto something else, think about something else, and then you can deal with them. Barbara and I are walkers. We walk everywhere. We live in Westbury on Trim, near the Downs in Bristol. Um, we used to go for an hour's walk a day. Sometimes up to the Downs, sometimes around Camford Park, sometimes down to the shops. Now the thing is, one day Barbara went up there on her own, and she said, I'm going for an hour's walk. Hour and a half later, she weren't back. So I got a bit worried, so I jumped in the car, went round the downs, round Circular Road, looking for, uh, to see if I could see her, because I knew roughly where she, where she would be walking. Couldn't find her. Cut a very long story short, she was missing for five hours. I went everywhere, I couldn't find her anywhere. Just on my way to Southmead Police Station to report her as a missing person, driving down the street, and there she was coming towards me. So I took her home, and she's never walked on her own since. She either walks with me or one of our friends or one of our family because she's vulnerable. She's lost what's called spatial awareness. She can't find her way around anymore. We all go to the supermarket and when you go to the supermarket you might see someone putting stuff in their trolley and they're putting the same thing over and over again. 12, 13 tins of baked beans, 14 tins of baked beans. 25 tins of baked beans and you think what's going on they've got dementia probably and they're suffering from an awful thing called obsessive compulsive disorder they're obsessive about not running out of beans for example barbara used to insist when we, we used to go f uh, shopping on a thursday afternoon she insists that we'd have three loaves of bread in our in our basket we don't eat three loaves of bread a week so i'd buy three this week and then for the next two i wouldn't buy any one day at home, when I was doing the housework, I went up to the bedroom to do, do, do the bedroom, went round to her side of the bed, and there was an awful smell round there. Anyway, I traced this smell to her wardrobe. When I opened the door, there was a loaf of bread in there, gone mouldy. So that went straight in the bin. But I know what she was thinking. She didn't want to run out of bread, so she'd put a loaf in, in, the, in the wardrobe for safekeeping. She wouldn't run out of bread. 
but you don't put bread in the wardrobe, do you? You put it in the bread bin. So people, can suffer, people suffering from OCD can sometimes do the most strangest of things. They're strange to us, but to them they're perfectly logical. I could tell you some of the things that people have told me they've found in the fridge, things you wouldn't think of. So people with dementia can do strange things. Going back to the supermarket, once we've got our stuff in the trolley, what do we do then? Got to pay for it. How do we pay for our goods? Money. Money. Money's one way. And what's happened to our money in the uh, last few years? All our notes have changed, haven't they? Some of our coins have changed. Last year we introduced a new pound coin. Uh, but some people with dementia, they could have trouble with a 50p piece and a 20p piece, for example, because they're similar shape, they've got straight edges, they're pentagons, to use the proper phrase, but we know that the 50p is bigger than the 20p because it's worth more. But someone with dementia might not be able to process that anymore, so when they're at the, uh, the, the cash desk and they're counting out their money, they can't remember which coin's which. And we can help, and we tell the the children this, when you see something like that, ask your mum if you can go and help that person. Excuse me, you seem to be having a problem there with your money, can we offer you some help? They might say, no thanks, I'm fine. But at least you've tried to do something constructive rather than stand there in the, in the queue, stamping your feet and tooting, because that gets nowhere. Another way of paying for our goods is, what do you need to remember with a card? No, not the contactless one, because you. The PIN, how many of you have forgotten your PIN number? And you haven't got dementia. Okay, someone with dementia, with a memory problem, might well get to the stage where they want to pay with their card, but they can't remember their PIN number. So these are some of the ways in which dementia can present itself uh, anywhere. Dementia can also affect people's, begins with P, perception. perception. You probably realise by now that I'm not a Bristolian. I'm a company, and oh, <laughs> cheers, Mike. Uh, and when we were growing up, we lived in modern flats, and outside everybody's front door was a black rubber welcome mat. Now, if you take somebody with dementia up to a door where there's a black mat, you and I will see a black mat. Because their perception's been affected, they might see a hole. And if you try and walk them across it, they'll hold you back. Because you don't walk across holes, they're dangerous, aren't they? And if you try and walk round it, they'll walk round very gingerly. And what I'm telling you here is not based on what I think. This is based on research being conducted by Stirling University. And if you go on the Stirling University website, you can read reams of stuff all about this. So it can affect your perception. Dementia is something which means the symptoms will gradually get worse. Progressive. My grandson, Sam, he was five at the time, he's 13 now, came over for a, uh, a sleepover with his brother. And on the Friday night, we're playing with his toys. Well, I'm playing with his toys. And he says to me, Granddad, why has Nanny got dementia? So I said, Sam, I don't know why Nanny's got dementia. I said, even the doctors and the scientists don't know why we get dementia. They're still trying to find out the cause and when they find the cause, they can find a cure. But what's going to happen is, when you come over and Nanny makes you all them special things grandmas make their grandchildren, butterfly cakes, gingerbread men, little Easter nests with mini eggs in, yeah, grandmas do that sort of stuff, don't they? Yeah. Of course they do. Some of you are grandmas, you know you do. Okay, I said, she won't be able to do that anymore because she might not be able to remember the ingredients or she might not be able to read the recipe book. So she might even forget your birthday. But don't worry, I know where Nanny's birthday book is with all your birthdays in, so I'll buy the card and I'll buy the present so you won't miss out. So she might even forget your name. It's not that she doesn't like you anymore, it's just that the illness in our brain has got to a stage where she just can't remember names. I said, she might even forget my name and I've been married to her for all these years. I said, but go over there, jump on her lap, put your arms around her neck, give her a big hug and a big kiss and say to her, Nanny, I really love you, because she still loves you because you're a grandson. And she loves all of you. We've got eight grandchildren, two great-grandchildren. 
So in that way, I tried to tell Sam at the age of five that this illness is terminal, it's progressive, there's no cure at the moment, there's precious little treatment, and we live in the real world. So we've had several discussions with not just Sam, but with all our grandchildren and our children. We have what we call family conferences every now and again. We talk about all this stuff and we're trying to deal with it as best we can. But dementia is progressive until they find a cure, which is why we need loads of money in research. And in, in Bristol, we have the Brain Centre at Southmead Hospital, which is doing brilliant research, not just in the dementia, but all brain injuries or conditions. One in so many people over uh, 80 will go on to develop dementia. Three. One in three over 80, one in 14, one in 14 over 65. That's a couple of statistics off the Alzheimer's website. Dementia affects each person in blank ways. Different. I think I've explained some of the different ways in which it can affect people. It, they might not have all these symptoms, they might just have one or two. But as soon as you notice something like this, you can say to yourself, have they got early onset dementia? I want to tell you about a mate of mine, Mike's Mike. Mike is married to Lynn, Mike's a carpenter. He came home one day and he said to Lynn, I'm going to have to pack the job in, can't get me measurements right. So Lynn says, what are you going to do then? He said, I'm going to go down at Link Age. What are you going to do down there? He said, I fancy joining their cooking class. Okay, so they go down to Link Age and Lynn says to the guy, Mike wants to join your cooking class. Okay, two o'clock, Tuesday afternoon. Yeah, but Mike's got dementia. Two o'clock, Tuesday afternoon. Yeah, but Mike's got dementia. Well, that's all right. If he comes along two o'clock, Tuesday afternoon, he can do cooking. We'll support him doing his cooking. So Mike goes along two o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon, does cooking. By all accounts, he's turning out some pretty good stuff. Some of it's even edible. <laughs> when he tells the story about Pam, Pam is now 93. Pam wanted to do archery. Yes! I hope I'm that positive when I'm 93, if ever I get to 93. So Pam's 93, in a wheelchair, got dementia, doing archery. Mike, you've got a job to get hold of him now. His social life has so changed, you can never get hold of the bloke. He's never at home. So Mike and Pam, they've got dementia, but they're living as well as they can, even though they have got this awful disease. So when people say it's all doom and gloom, it's not doom and gloom. We're living with dementia. It's not all doom and gloom. Sometimes we have, we have had a laugh today, haven't we, Janet? We are. When we're having dinner. So it's not all doom and gloom. People are living as well as they can, even though they've got this awful disease. I want to tell you two stories. Both of these came off the telly. One's actually on YouTube now, if you're a YouTube fan. And the first story concerns a care home in the Midlands. I think it was Nottingham. And it focused on this carer who was looking after a 90-year-old guy with dementia. And this carer was a really good carer. Used to take this bloke out, used to take him swimming, used to do all sorts of activities. Uh, but he, would never, he could never really get this 90-year-old to come alive. Anyway, one day he hit on the fact that this 90-year-old used to work in the Raleigh car factory, making cars. And once you started talking about him, he suddenly started talking. So he decided to take him there for a visit to walk down memory lane. So in between organising the visit and actually going, he actually found somebody who had this model Raleigh car that this bloke used to make thousands of. So he rang him up and he said, I'm taking him to the Raleigh car factory. Can you bring your car along and put it on the forecourt? Yeah, OK, so the bloke agreed. So on the day of the visit, they come out of Nottingham Station, they're walking down the road, Suddenly this 90-year-old uh, says, hey, I used to work down here. They get a bit nearer, he says, there it is, there's my old factory. Gets a bit nearer, he says, hey, look, grabs hold of the car, rushes him off, see this widget here, I used to do that bit there, don't go there, he used to go, you couldn't shut him up. Why? Because they'd hit upon the fact what made this guy tick was his job. Was Riley, talk about Riley cars, he talked till Larry came on. You know, that was what made this guy tick. There's more to the person 
abandoned dementia. Second story is a bit closer to home. This is about another 90-year-old in a care home in Somerset. And his name's Edward. So if you go on YouTube and put Edward into YouTube, this story will come up. And Edward, as I say, is a 90-year-old with dementia, and he's the stereotypical person with dementia. Sat in the common room of a care home, in the corner, totally depressed, not talking to anyone. Anyway, he was allocated a new carer. And this carer was a young guy in his 20s or 30s, and he wanted to make a difference. So he goes along to the care home, and uh, whatever he tried just won't work. So anyway, one day he took along his guitar, started playing his guitar, and he realised that Edward was responding to this. And so, with a bit of probing, he found out that Edward used to play piano in a jazz band. So they went on social media and they said, are there any musicians out there that could come along to the home and jam with Edward? You know, have a, have a music session. They had 80 responses. Three of them were blokes that used to play in the same band. So on the day, these guys turn up and they're playing their instruments. Edward's playing the piano by ear. Quite novel, really. Most people play by hand. And there they are, jamming and having a good time. So not only has it brought Edward out of himself, not only has it shown them that Edward has got something that makes him tick, if they need any music at that care home now, Edward, my old son, fancy knocking a few notes out on the old Joanna. They're made, aren't they? There's more to the person than the dementia. One of the things you've been considering is whether to open a coffee morning or a, a, a memory calf. We run a memory calf, and what we've done is we've trained our volunteers to not just talk to the carer, but to talk to the person with dementia. Because the person with dementia is still a member of the family, still a member of the community. They're just ill. So let's treat them as a member of the family or a member of the community. People used to say to me years ago, can Barbara do this? And I used to say, well, ask her. Don't ask me, ask her. She's got a voice, you know, she's got a voice in her head. Okay, she's past that now. But what I'm saying to you is, these people are individuals. Let's treat them as individuals. Let's try and find out what makes them tick. Maybe it was working on the production line at Riley. Maybe it was working in the wheels factory. Maybe it was, maybe they were a military person. Maybe they've been in the Navy and they can talk to you uh, all day long about HMS Gloucester and the ports that they used to visit. If we find out what makes the person tick, we can treat them as a person, which is what they are. Dementia Friends is about turning understanding into action. So let's talk about this church. If you're going to do anything in the, in the church, the first thing you need to do is what we've just done. When we did it at our church at Westbury Baptist, it all started about 10 years ago when we had a modernisation project to totally change the front of our church. So once we'd done it, uh, we decided that we, the, the front of the church was really now really brilliant if we wanted to open a cafe. But when we set about a cafe, that was about the time Barbara got diagnosed formally. So I said, OK, that's phase two of this cafe. Can we have a memory cafe? But we call it Happy Days because people with dementia can look back to happy days. They can have happy days now and they can still look forward to happy days because people with dementia can still live as well as they can even though they've got this awful disease. Uh, and the idea is we're just silly for two hours. What's the best medicine anyone can ever have? Laugh. Laughter. So we make them laugh. So the idea is we have a theme every month um, and we invite an activity leader in to lead that activity. It might be one of us or it might be someone from outside. Like, for example, uh, two years ago, it was the Queen's 90th birthday. So we decided we had bunting all up and uh, we, we, we had red, white and blue flags. We had red, white and blue tablecloths. We had red, white and blue cakes. And uh, we all dressed up silly and we bought a tiara because I couldn't get a crown and we had our, our oldest lady, Jean, she was 90 the same year as the Queen, not on the same day. So we put the tiara on, she was princess for the afternoon. 
and she blew the candles out on the cake. We didn't have 90, we had nine. So the idea is we have fun and we have a different activity each week. Oh, the other thing, by the way, is that people say to me, where'd you get your staff from? What I did, I went to the church meeting and I said, can I advertise for anybody in the community to come and help at our, at our memory calf? And that's what we did. We put a letter in our local uh, news that went round. It's called BS9 because I live in BS9. And as a result of that, we have trained 18 volunteers. Half of our volunteers come from the church, half of them come from the community. Um, and when they, when they first applied to be a memory calf volunteer, we got them all together. We did this dementia friend session, because if you're going to work with people with dementia, you, you need to know what dementia is. So we did this, and then we spent a time talking about, OK, how are we going to run the calf? And that's why I say we, we talk to the carer and the person with dementia. When they come in, we give them a badge. We've all got badges. They're taken to a table, they sit down on a table with perhaps six or eight people. They don't sit on their own. They sit with other people who they can talk with. We have an information table where we provide information if they want to know. We don't ram it down their throat that it's a memory calf. We call it happy days. We don't call it happy days memory calf. I will to you because you're not at a cafe because people with dementia don't want it rammed down their throat all the time that they've got a problem. We also have a memory table. So we put things at a table like this, and we put stuff on there from years ago, like who remembers a Russian book? One of the ladies gave us a Russian book. How many of you remember milk bottles? They're coming back, aren't they? Coming back, yeah? So we got a milk bottle. Uh, gas mask. Anything from years ago to stimulate their memory, because it's a memory table. And sometimes we, if they haven't looked at it for a while, I'll get a few of the items and we have a quiz about walking down uh, memory lane and we have a quiz just to stimulate their memory. So it's about being silly. One of the things Mike said to me is you're thinking of having singing for the brain. This is a church. What do you do in church? Sing. Keep doing it, because it helps to keep Dementia at bay. And if you, it, it's been recognised that singing is really good for the brain. Why? Because it's a physical activity. You have to learn to breathe properly. It's an intellectual activity because you have to remember the words or read the words. And it's a social activity because unless you're me, you sing with other people. So singing ticks all the boxes. It's really good. Keep doing it. But I hope what I've done in the last 45 minutes is to give you some ideas of what dementia is and how you as a church can build a dementia-friendly community right here in Dimmock.